like to think of Azure Cognitive Services as machine learning the easy way. Because there's a lot of, of things you can do with machine learning these days. And if you understand the science behind it, there's some really amazing things you can do. And that's great. The problem is, I'm a moron. And so a lot of that stuff goes right over my head. And I can really appreciate some of the other speakers we have at this conference that really understand that, the, the, the backing behind it. Um, there's an acquaintance of mine named Matthew Renzi, who's just a brilliant individual. And he understands the math, and he can explain it really well. But a lot of times on my projects, I just don't have time to dive into that. I've got a line of business application that I need to get out the door. I've got a deadline. And I'd like to do some image recognition, or I'd like to do some sentiment analysis, but I don't have time to build up a big model and train it. So cognitive services becomes really valuable to developers like me, and hopefully to some of you as well, who want the power of machine learning without uh, the time required it would take to build up a model. Do I have any XKCD fans in here? Yeah, XKCD is brilliant work. And they had this cartoon a couple years ago, and it was actually making a point about how there are some things in software that are easy and some that are very difficult. And sometimes it's really hard to explain to your end user what the difference is. So in this case, uh, we have this fictitious end user that comes up and says, when a user takes a photo, the app should check whether they're in a national park. And the developer says, sure, that's an easy GIS lookup. Give me a few hours. But then the second requirement is to check whether the photo is of a bird. And the developer says, I'll need a research team in five years. Now, when that comic was released, that was probably fairly accurate. And it does, the comic does make a good point about how sometimes users think, you know, you've got two requirements and they should take about the same amount of time. And they really are orders of magnitude different. What's fascinating is that with cognitive services, we can now achieve this in just a handful of lines of code. Let's pull up the demo here. What we've got is some code that will call out to Azure Cognitive Services. And it's going to analyze this batch of images. So we've got two pictures, actually three pictures of birds, a picture of a cat, a dog, and a snake. And we'll feed those into cognitive services and have it run its image analysis on it. And we will then look to see if it can tell which ones are birds and which ones are not. And you can see uh, we've got you know, the first one, true, it's a bird. That one's true, it's a bird. The one that's a swallow, yep, true. So it looks like we were six for six. And we did not take five years in a giant research team. Well, technically we did, except that five years was paid down by Microsoft and that research team was paid by Microsoft. We're simply calling their API. And so let's see, we've got 69 lines of code in here, some of which are, you know, you've got a block and all we're doing is passing in uh, an array of images. But the hard part of the code is that we have to initiate this client and uh, we have to pass in it. We have to have our subscription set up, which we'll look at that in a minute. And then after that, uh, we have a method that uh, goes out and asynchronously passes that image to the Cognitive Services Library, which will then return the analysis results and then 
for this little demo, we're just looking at the tags to see if any of the tags are set to bird. And we'll look at this code in more detail here in a minute. But the point that I want to make is that we can now satisfy these requirements in 69 lines of code or less. And that's really where the power of cognitive services is, is that we can do these kind of really powerful things without a lot of effort on our part. Now admittedly, because we are leveraging someone else's models, because we're leveraging Microsoft's models, they're not trained to our specific needs. And if we need to do something more customized, we might need to use a different tool chain. There are tools like ML.net and TensorFlow that are very good and very powerful. And if you need a custom model, you should be looking at those. But if you want a very general model, you could have this done today. A lot of times we can think of machine learning as being this very powerful tool, but it takes a lot of work to get it right. You know, there's a lot of knobs and buttons. And sometimes what you want is just like a, a friendly way to get the answers you're looking for. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a friendly robot, uh, well, my laser pointer's not working. If there, if, there's, if there was this friendly robot that we could ask these questions of. So instead of doing all of the fine tuning, we can just ask him. And because he's representing cognitive services, we'll call this friendly robot Coggy. And he's just there and you can ask him questions. He's already done the training, right? He's had the data model and has gone through the entire training process. He's already gone through the education process and he's learned everything he needs to learn. The data's all been collected and fed in. So he's really pretty good to go. And he's really friendly. It just kind of works. He lives in the cloud, so we don't have to worry about maintaining any of the infrastructure. In fact, all we have to do... Uh, oops. to get started is come into our Azure portal, which I'll assume that you guys know how to either already have Azure accounts or can set one up yourself. And to create a new cognitive services service, I just come in here to the add menu and search for cognitive services. And I'll go ahead and create that. Come on. And normally when you click on buttons in the Azure portal, something, there it goes. Apparently I wasn't clicking it hard enough. And like a lot of things with cognitive services, I need to pick my region and uh, I need to put it in a research group. And I will agree to be a part of, or send my telemetry back to Microsoft. So I can now go ahead and create this. And it'll take some time to spin it up, but that was it. That was all I needed to do to be able to have this API endpoint that I can call. And like a lot of the other cognitive, or a lot of the other Azure resources, Cognitive Services has a free tier. So as I am just starting to explore it, um, it's not gonna start billing me right away. Uh, it, I forget what the threshold is where I start paying for it. But when you consider exactly what you're getting and the power that you're getting from Cognitive Services, is actually a, huge, uh, a really nice value proposition.
And the interaction with cognitive services is fairly conversational. The idea with Coggy is that I just want to be able to ask him a question and he gives me answers back. So I might ask him, what is the sentiment score for this statement? Found a great step-by-step -step implementation for genetic algorithms. Hope this helps. And he would just reply back and say, the sentiment score for that statement is 91%. If you're not familiar with sentiment scores, sentiment scores are the general idea of how positive or negative a statement is. If a statement is very excited or encouraging or upbeat, it's gonna have a sentiment score closer to 100%. If it's very negative uh, or very angry, it will have a sentiment score closer to zero. And so this is the kind of ideal interaction that I would like to have. In reality, it's a little bit more like this because Cognitive Services has a REST API. And so I'm going to pass in JSON to my REST endpoint and I'm going to get JSON back. But that's okay because I understand REST. I understand JSON. I have tools for parsing that. And to make it even easier, Microsoft provides wrappers in a lot of different languages so that aren't, even the rest is abstracted away from me. I now just have a, a method that I need to call, and we saw this in the bird analyzer earlier, where, um, where I call and request the sentiment score or the image analysis or whatever, and it comes back with all of the information. And so to actually request the sentiment score for that statement, this is all the code that I need. In fact, let's look at a demo of this. So I'm instantiating a new text analysis API client. And often what we'll do with cognitive services is instead of just sending one text item to be analyzed at a time, we might send a bunch, and so we actually have to batch them up in this multi-language batch input. And each individual input has the language, because this does work in several languages. We're going to be working in English today. Uh, and we have to give the statement an ID. So I'll just give it an ID of one. And then I'll pass in the text that I want to analyze. And when it comes back, it's going to come back with a, a document ID, which this document ID will match that document ID. Are you, are you doing a demo right now? I am. There we go. So yeah, I'm going to instantiate Here's the, the client that I care about. Like I said, I'm gonna batch these up. The result from the, uh, from, the, from the method call will come back with a list of documents. And so this document ID here will line up with that document ID so I can fold the information back together. And then use, if I'm using the sentiment analysis, I will just have a score here and so if I run this, you can see pretty quickly it came back and it's showing, that, showing me that my sentiment score is 91. And again, all of this was done in 39 lines of code. And while, yes, I'm just getting that one sentiment score back, behind that is this very large, well-trained model that understands the English language and understands something about how people feel about it. So the demos that I'm doing today are all in the C-sharp language and the C-sharp wrappers around sentiment analysis are available via NuGet. 
Obviously, if you're using the REST API, you can use any language you want that has REST libraries, which is most of them. And there, are, there is really good documentation for other languages like Java and Node.js and Python. And so this is not a platform that is specific to uh, C Sharp or Microsoft first languages. They've done a really nice job of making this available in almost any uh, platform. So let's talk about some of the other services that Cognitive Services provides. They're kind of grouped into five high-level categories. The first category is the Vision API. The Vision API is the one that we use to recognize that bird picture at the beginning. So in the Vision APIs, we can do things like image analysis. We can do things like facial detection. Does this image have uh, a face in it or a person in it? Um, it can do facial detection also in video, if you want to upload a video clip. There's a content moderation API inside of Cognitive Services where I can upload an image and it will tell me whether or not that image is explicit. And it's actually not binary. It, again, will have a, a percentage score about how confident Cognitive Services is in that the image is explicit. You can imagine that being very helpful for a website where you're allowing users to upload images because people on the internet are what they are. If you're allowing users to upload things, at some point somebody's gonna try and upload something they shouldn't. And if you want to manually process all the images and manually moderate them, you can do that, but it'll be very time consuming, especially as your website scales so being able to have an API where you can simply get a score back on whether or not that image is ex explicit could be a very powerful feature in your web app. There's also the speech API or the speech set of services. And here we can do things like uh, speech to text. We can do speaker recognition, uh, text to speech. Um, some of this is involved in the underlying code behind uh, the Lewis framework. If you were in here last hour, Rabib did a nice demo of Lewis. And so actually some of the cognitive services are used behind the scenes for Lewis. There's also the language API. The language API has things like the text analysis service. That's what we used to, uh, to uh, analyze the sentiment of a statement earlier. The company I worked for is called Aptera, and we did some really interesting work with the sentiment analysis for a client of ours around a product launch. They wanted to be able to monitor social media for mentions of this product. And so as word got out on social media about this product, we would run each one of those statements through the sentiment analysis API. And if the sentiment was really strong, then obviously their marketing department would want to retweet that or share it on LinkedIn or like it on Facebook, anything they could do to, to uh, amplify those positive statements. Conversely, if the sentiment of a statement that was found was really low, they could actually have someone from their tech service or their service department reach out to the user and ask them if there's anything they could do to help. And so it was a really interesting way to kind of automatically follow what was being said about their product and respond appropriately. The language services group also has some spell check options, it has some of their translation services, and there's also a text content moderation so in the same way you can do content moderation on images, you can also do content moderation on text. The knowledge service group has a single service in it called Q&A Maker. And Q&A Maker is a little bit different, and I'll show you a demo of this in a little bit. 
But it allows you to upload a list of questions and answers. And there's a handful of different formats it supports. CSV maybe being the simplest. And then once you have that uploaded, you can feed questions into cognitive services against your knowledge base. And it will try and match up the question with an answer that it already knows. So while for most of the cognitive services, you can't really alter the model, for Q&A Maker, you can augment the functionality by uploading your knowledge base. And what cognitive services is really doing is trying to match the question that's being fed in with a, list of, with a question that it's already uh, seen so that it can return the correct answer. We did a project with the Q&A Maker for Another one of our clients, they support uh, over 100 desktop applications in their enterprise. And their, tech, their uh, tech support department realized that by and large, when they got calls or emails, they were getting the same 20 questions over and over again. And so they built out a frequently asked question list of about 50 questions and answers and posted on an internal web page. And for some reason, their users never actually went to that frequently answered question page. So what they did was they built a bot that ran in their Microsoft Teams environment. And so when users went to get tech support, they started by talking to this chat bot in Teams and they could ask the question. And the, that chatbot then used Q&A Maker to try and find an answer for them. If it couldn't find an answer or the user was unsatisfied, then it would send, create a support ticket with the question, which had already been asked, and send it to a real person. And using this Q&A Maker and also the bot framework, they were able to reduce the number of tech support calls that actually got to one of their uh, support staff. The last group of cognitive services that are worth talking about uh, are these search services. And basically what you have here is you have Coggy running to Bing for you. So cognitive services serv surfaces web search, visual search, custom search, video search, news search, all those types of things uh, through a REST API. So going back to this idea of sentiment analysis, um, I wanted to do an experiment to see how sentiment analysis, sentiment analysis would work on a subreddit. Have you guys spend any time on Reddit? So you guys probably understand this for those of you that don't. Reddit can be a really valuable place to get information. It can also be a cesspool. <laughs> it uh, it kind of runs the gamut. And so what I thought would be interesting would be able to take a subreddit, run all the titles through sentiment analysis, and then be able to filter them back only to the ones that were uh, had high sentiment scores. So let's look at a demo of this. So here we're looking at the programming subreddit. And I've got this slider so I can slide from more negative to more positive. And you can see I have filtered down the list of titles on the subreddit homepage to the ones that are positive. I could take this slider and crank this up to be uh, the most positive. And so now I'm only getting the sentiment score, or the titles whose sentiment score is above 90%. Um, this first number is the number of votes the post has received on, Re on Reddit, and then the second number is the sentiment score. 
And you can see this top title uh, says, at 22 years old, Postgres might be the most advanced database yet. And that got a sentiment score of 85.9%. And so that's clearly pretty good. Um, by the way, this demo is running at emotionalreddit.azurewebsites.net. This is actually live on the internet if you want to play around with it and see what it does. Um, but if you read through these titles, you can see it's doing an okay job. One of the things that I have noticed about the sentiment analysis is that it generally works better on larger blocks of text and sometimes is confused by shorter blocks of text. So this title here, using DVO with an existing Docker image, maybe doesn't seem like it should get an 85% sentiment score, but it's short enough that maybe it's kind of confusing it. One of the things that can be kind of amusing would be to look at the negative ones. So this is now anything below 30%. Uh, let's see, what's the, yeah, this top one here, Australian programmers could be fired by their companies for implementing, gov uh, for government back, implementing government back doors. And you can see, yeah, that's, that's pretty negative. You know, fired is clearly a pretty negative word. Um, yeah, uh, here, here, here again is a shorter title, while we blink, we lose the web. Again, that, I don't understand why that's getting such a low sentiment score, but um, certainly, certainly that's the score we're getting back. And if we want to play around with a different subreddit, we just specify the name here. Um, in the Python subreddit, we have a story here, quitting Python development after two years of nonstop learning, and it blows. I... Uh, I don't, maybe don't agree with that, that story. I don't agree with the premise of not liking learning, but I do agree that that sentiment score seems awful low. Here's another one, bat file not fully working. So if something's not working, that's obviously kind of a bad thing. One interesting thing with this project, where are we at here? is that uh, I actually implemented the, the business logic for this in F-sharp um, because I like F-sharp and also just to kind of show that this doesn't have to be a C-sharp thing. If you want to look at this code more later, find me, I'll gladly explain what it's doing. Uh, explaining the F-sharp is probably a little bit outside the scope of this topic but uh, I would gladly go through it with you in more detail. Oh, I went all the way back to the beginning. All right, let's go back and look a little bit in a little bit more detail at that bird recognizer. Now that you understand a little bit more about what Cognitive Services is doing, uh, let's uh, dive in a little bit deeper. One of the things that's kind of interesting about the Vision Cognitive Services is that we can actually request what kind of information we get back. And because what I really want to be able to do is look at the tags to see if any of the tags identifies it as a bird. All I'm requesting here is visualfeatures.tags. In that case, you have to provide the predefined list of tags, and then you get the probability for every of them, or there is a, the system will come up with whatever they find as a valid tag. OK, so the question was, do I, as the client, have to provide a predefined list of tags? The answer is no. Uh, in fact, I have no control over what tags come back. The machine learning model that backs cognitive services has a giant list of tags that it has created. And all I can do is look at the list of tags that comes back. And in this case, I'm 
uh, here on line 58. I'm simply checking for the word bird in one of the tags. Um, I'll come, I've got another slide on that in a minute. Um, so let's come back to that, okay? You, I assume you had another question. Yes. Okay, ask it after I, um, I've got a little more information first. You can see here that the, uh, there's not a lot of code here that's actually doing the work. There is just a slight bit of work to read in the image file and get it as a stream. And then really what I'm doing is calling this ima analyze image in stream async, which is provided in that NuGet package. And then I have this image analysis object that comes back that has the tags and some of the other information. So really, that one line of code is doing most of the, the work. That line of code is our interface into the machine learning algorithm. Now, if we were working in another language, we wouldn't use the NuGet package, um, unless it was VB or F Sharp. But if we were working in Python, we'd have to use the REST API. And so I have another, dem or another version of the same application, which is using C Sharp, but using the REST API. Again, we're going to pass in uh, the same set of images. And um, yeah, we have this asynchronous method called imageIsBird which is going to call this make analysis request method. And this is really where the heavy list lifting works. We're going to instantiate a new HTTP client. Um, we do need to pass in the subscription key. When we created that resource in Azure, we got a subscription key, that's the security. And actually we are passing that same subscription key into the constructor of the client that we saw in the previous demo. But in this case, I need to add it as an HTTP header for OCP APIM subscription key. And for the features that I want back, I'm going to just add a query string to the URL, specifying that the visual features equals the tag, and I want the results back in English. Uh, and then I will take that query string and add it to my base URL, uh, which that base URL does have to be specific to your region. If we were to look in uh, the Azure portal, where's the one it just created? Oh, there it is. Oops. Hey, there's the API key that I have, which you guys shouldn't use, but I'm going to delete this resource as soon as this demo is over anyway. So, oh, I got to hover text where I didn't want it. But you can see my endpoint is specific to South Central US. That's because when I created this, I picked South Central US as the region. And so in my code, this URL here, uh, URI base, will have that URL and it will be region specific. If you pick the wrong region in your URL, you will get uh, an error back. Uh, because I'm using the REST API, I have to have my own method this time to get the byte array from the file. Um, but that's not cognitive, speci cognitive services specific. And I'll just add that content uh, to my HTTP request. And then I'll do an async post, which will give me a JSON result back. I can deserialize that JSON, JSON response into my tag data. And again, analyze the tags. So it's a little bit more work to build up the request by hand, but again, certainly not something you couldn't accomplish pretty quickly. And so if you're using a different language, um, 
like Go or Python and you want to use cognitive services, it's not going to be a problem to call this REST API. Uh, in the code so far, we've just been looking at uh, the tags to see whether or not one of them was bird. But I wanted to do a little bit different demo where I just dump out all the tags that come back so you can see what kind of things you get. So for this first test file, bird.jpg, actually the, the algorithm comes back with the most confident result that it is an animal, and that's at 93.7%. It's worth noting that almost everything cognitive services does comes back with a confidence score. Machine learning is not an exact science, and so it's never going to be totally binary whether or not it thinks that it's you know, a bird or not. It's just not true or false is bird. No, it's going to give you a confidence of uh, each tag. And so we can see that it's 93% confident this is an animal, 92.5% confident it's a bird. Uh, only 64% confident that it's an ocean, uh, which I don't know much about birds, but sounds plausible. Uh, we can. Uh, we can see for some of the other uh, images, like the dog image, it's actually 99.9% .9 sure that's a dog. Uh, fairly confident it's an animal and a mammal. Not all of the tags are describing the subject uh, directly. Uh, there is a tag coming back for standing because it thinks the dog is standing at 92%. Um, you know, with the snake, the tags we get back are animal, reptile, snake, and wildlife. Uh, for that last image, we have a 99.98% confidence that the image has sky, which is true. Um, pretty high confidences for bird, animal, outdoor, perched. Um, oh, and my screen, oops, my screen is cutting it off. But uh, it is 4.4% confident it is a swallow, which the images actually have a swallow. Um, but Cognitive Services is not very sure about that. Cognitive Services also cannot calculate the airspeed velocity of said swallow. Yeah. I can't, I, I can't hear you. So the question was, uh, is there any confidence that they will continue to improve the machine learning model? So again, this is one of those things where we have to understand what cognitive services is, right? Because we don't have any control over the data that's being fed in. We have to be confident that Microsoft will continue to feed data in and improve the data set as they have it, make it available. The value proposition for cognitive services is that someone else, in this case Microsoft, is training the model for us. If what we wanted to do was have a data set that was very specific to birds, we would probably collect our own images and tag them with the different species. Um, and and we get much more specific results back on birds, right? We could use tools like ML.net to build a bird database and get bird specific results. Cognitive services means that we're going to trust someone else's more generalized uh, machine learning model. Microsoft is continuing to maintain it but I think to your question, we don't know exactly what they're feeding in. Um, so if what you want to do is have something more specific to birds, you're probably gonna go down the route of building out your own model. Um, in fact, you could build out a model that could tell the difference between the American and the European swallow and whether or not they are laden or not. 
Yes. Uh, is that list of tags public list that you can review and say, okay, I, I'm looking for this or for this or for this? So the question is whether or not the list of available tags is a public list. I don't believe so. If that list of potential tags is available, I've never seen it. Because it will do analysis on any image that we upload, clearly the list of potential tags is huge. Um, and so when I've used it, what we've done is started feeding in test images and seen what tags came back and just started keying off of the tags that we were seeing. Um, so how can I then uh, look for what I want for now? So like what I was doing with the bird recognizer is I was looking specifically for a bird. And so with some of my testing, I realized that the tag that was coming back was just bird. And so I was looking for that. Um, well, for instance, just in a specific example, I want to look or to know if there is sexual content in that image. All right. Let's, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. You're one step ahead of me. Why don't we, oops, that's the demo we've already done. Let's look at all of the things that we can request. And we'll now um, analyze this image and I, apologize for the egregious name dropping. You'll see why I use this image in a minute. But in the, in the samples we've looked at so far, we've simply requested the tags. And certainly the tags uh, provide some of the most useful information. For example, if I upload this particular image, uh, I will get tags that come back for uh, man, person, indoor, standing, and posing. And all those tags are generally accurate. Um, and there are confidence scores with all of them. Again, I've not seen like a compre comprehensive list of potential tags, but as they come back, uh, I can start to find which ones I want to key off of. There's another attribute I can look at for image type. And this is basically just going to tell me whether or not Cognitive Services thinks that this image is clip art or if it's a line drawing. And in this case, neither of those come back as true because it's a photograph. Cognitive Services can also do some analysis on the colors that appear in the image and it comes back in a JSON document that looks kind of like this. Now, to, this, is, this, one, this slide addresses your question about the content moderation, whether or not something is explicit. There are actually two fields that come back, one for um, is adult and one for is racy. And we get confidence scores that come back for both of those. I think the difference here is just that uh, uh, racy would be uh, maybe a little less explicit, and the adult is maybe a little more. And again, we have confidence scores on both of these. So depending on the audience of your web application, uh, you might cho choose to filter out uh, the racy content at different thresholds. If we were doing a web application that was targeted towards elementary school kids, we might want to filter out anything that is remotely racy. Um, if we're doing something maybe in the medical profession where there's a lot more legitimate reasons to have anatomy, we might set that score much lower. Uh, you can see that both of these have very low scores since there's nothing uh, really inappropriate about this image whatsoever. There is also the face API where it will identify faces in an image. Do you guys remember the demo that Microsoft did a couple years ago where they built out a website called howold.net where you can upload an image and it will guess the age of all the people that appear in it? 
Basically, HowOld.net was just a thin wrapper over the Faces API. Uh, in this case, Cognitive Services uh, identified two faces, one a male age 44, one a male age 31, which might not be entirely accurate, but we'll take it. And it returns a bounding box that gives the dimensions of the image. And if you draw those bounding boxes in, this is the region or the two regions that it identified as being potentially faces. Uh, and then the last visual feature we can request is description. And the description comes back with a bunch of tags, but maybe most appropriately, it comes, or most interestingly, it actually comes back with a caption. And the caption here uh, is Scott Guthrie et al. posing for the camera. I'm guessing there aren't a lot of people in the world for whom Azure Cognitive Services will pick out their specific name. But if you're Scott Guthrie, you probably get that. My guess is because Scott Guthrie is the person that primarily demos Azure features when they first come out. I'm guessing they've like uploaded every picture of him ever taken so that his demos won't fail. And so it knows him really well. And I'm pretty content to be the at all in this picture. Um, if it said Scott Guthrie and Eric Potter, I'd be okay with that, but that's probably asking for too much. So uh, let me just show you in the code. So the question was whether or not these are all separate requests or is it configurable? If I change this line of code right here uh, to be uh, tags and um, description and faces, I would now get those three things back in a single request. And so the reason you're allowed to configure it is that um, obviously the fewer things you request, the faster it's going to come back. And so you're kind of trading uh, speed for uh, the amount of detail you could get there. I could easily request all of the visual features and get it back in one request. Do you have any other questions while we're... They could, right? The, the question was whether or not the tags ever change. And again, because we don't control the model, yeah, they, they could come back different. Um, in the time that uh, I've been using cognitive services, I've not ever seen anything come back substantially different. Um, but that doesn't mean that maybe some of the like, lower confidence tags changed over time. Um, or what tags got returned may have changed. Good question, though. Other questions? All right. All right, the last demo I want to do is using the Q&A maker. And what we wanted to build out was a, again, another chat uh, interface bot that could answer questions for our HR department for the company I work for. I work for a company called Aptera. And again, similar to the client that we saw, you know, there are a handful of HR questions that come in all the time. And so uh, we wanted people to be able to ask those questions in our Slack environment. And are you guys familiar with the show, The Office? So what was the name of the HR professional in The Office? Toby, right? So this little application is called RoboToby. 
uh, because it's our little automated HR assistant. And I'll run this real quick so you can see what it does. And so I can come in here and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use a console application instead of the Slack bot, but the functionality would be the same. But I can come in here and say, why does it smell like bacon downstairs? And it will come back with responses um, to questions that it's seen before. So in this case, uh, we have a question in our knowledge base. Uh, why does it smell, or why does Aptera smell like bacon? And uh, the answer here is we just really like bacon and you should too. And we have a confidence score of 80%. Um, in our usage of this bot, uh, we set the minimum confidence threshold, I think, at 70%. So if we did not get a response back uh, above 70%, we assumed that there was no match whatsoever. Again, this was something that only works because we uploaded some Aptera-specific content. Um, as a side note, we have a tradition at Aptera where we have breakfast together every Friday morning. Our sales team cooks breakfast for all of the engineers. It's a lovely little tradition, especially if you like bacon. Um, and they do a great job. And so this actually is a legit question in our little knowledge base. Uh, we could ask a, a slightly more complicated question where we could say, what is the Aptera mission statement. And in this example, you can see that instead of just getting one potential answer back, Cognitive Services found several potential answers. And so uh, we can see it's got, uh, uh, it found a question here for what is Aptera's mission statement, which is essentially what I asked. Um, but it's worded a little differently. And there was another question of, that it found that was related, why is Aptera culture the best? But it's got a much lower confidence score. We can kind of see how the system works where uh, it will try and match up the text that came in with text that are recognized as uh, questions and then returns the appropriate responses, again, with that confidence score that we've been talking about. The code for this is, again, pretty straightforward. We have a little bit of code at the beginning to make the console request work. But much like um, the, the image recognizer, we're going to just use the REST API. So again, I have to put my security key into the header. I've got another URL. This one is specific to West US because that's where we happen to create this Azure resource. Um, and then we'll make, take the, the data and wrap it up and put it in the header. And then again, we'll just have a, it's just a simple HTTP post to our URL with the query string. And we'll get the response back and then analyze all the data in the JSON response uh, for the answer. When this runs in production, we actually run it as an Azure function so that the Slack API can call our Azure function, which has the, all the Q&A maker interface embedded into it. And so, um, yeah, we can surface all this right in our, in our Slack environment. One of the other noteworthy things about 
the Q&A service is that you can't, they actually have a nice portal for where you can manage your frequently asked questions and answers. You can upload questions into that data set uh, with CSV. If you have a web page that is obviously formatted with a question and answer format, you can actually feed it into, or feed it a URL of that FAQ page and Q&A Maker will try and parse out the questions and the answers. We found that to be a little finicky, but maybe our web page was just not formatted the way that it was expecting. Um, and so we had a lot better success just uploading a CSV file. So Q&A Maker is one of the places where um, you can feed in data. The only other place where you can feed cognitive services any kind of information is they do have a, um, a custom image recognition piece. So all of the demos I've done so far, we're simply using the standard cognitive services image recognition machine learning model. If I had a specific item I wanted to be able to recognize in the images, I can uh, feed some data into cognitive services and use a different rest endpoint that will then may also try to identify my, uh, my images. So for example, I have a client that works in the construction industry and they uh, produce steel building parts and on construction sites, a lot of times they will have like a forklift run over a clip that they need. And so what they wanted was to be able to take a, have general contractors take a picture of this damaged piece and be able to reorder more of it. And so for them, um, they're looking at how many images they would need to upload in order to have confident results come back where cognitive services could identify specific information about their specific construction materials. But other than those two pieces, the Q&A maker and the custom image search, you're using the uh, machine learning model uh, as Microsoft is providing it to you. So kind of in conclusion, the big value proposition of cognitive services is that I can get all the power of very modern, very powerful machine learning algorithms without having to implement it on my own. I just have Coggy there for me. I ask him questions, he returns answers. Um, what this means for me is that in applications that I'm developing for my clients, we can integrate some of this power without adding a lot of time to our schedule and our budget. Um, and we can just use some of that existing knowledge. Microsoft has done the heavy lifting. We just leverage it. It's as easy as calling out to a rest endpoint and getting answers. And uh, even for morons like me, we can integrate this into our line of business apps and get a lot of value out of it. Yeah. Okay, so the question was whether or not cognitive services are available in ML.net. Um, I'm trying to think about how to answer this. They're very different products, right? ML.net is a really amazing product that allows you to build your own models. But with ML.net, you are you're picking algorithms you are feeding it data, you are training data, you're building your own model. And ML.NET makes that much easier than if you had to do it by hand. But it's a very manual process. Cognitive services is basically taking existing models and just making them available in the cloud. And so could you use ML.NET to build out your own Q&A maker? Yeah. Could you use ML.NET to build out your own algorithm to do sentiment analysis? Yes. But ML.NET is, is much more targeted at, at custom models. So you can run 
take advantage of whatever Microsoft has built in this sense using ML.net as a proxy to get there. You need to feed your own data for that. As far as I know, yeah, you have to, f you have to feed your own data into it. If it would be interesting to know if there was a way to like seed your model with one of their models. I've not seen that uh, as something that's available. Um, so basically, if you are doing application for a customer, and the customer don't want to pay for the actual license, then you cannot use what they have built. Right. Um, and I didn't go into the, the Azure pricing very much. Um, there, like I said, there is a free tier, so if you're not using it very much, uh, it won't cost very much, if anything. Um, if, uh, and I, I haven't looked at the pricing in the last couple of weeks, and I, I know that just this Tuesday, Microsoft announced price cuts. So cognitive services actually just got cheaper. Um, and so I don't want to say anything wrong. And you can find the pricing online pretty easily. Um, for what it does, cognitive services is very competitively priced. Uh, I understand that some companies might not want to pay it. But if you think about what it would cost to do that manually, if you think about how much it would cost to pay a data scientist to build it, um, it's, it's, a huge, uh, it's a huge cost savings just to pay for the existing models. I like, yeah. So, so the question, and, and let me repeat it back. You tell me if I got this right. You want to be able to recognize specific cats. OK. So the, the demo I did using the vision services doesn't allow you to, to t add tags. What you could try to do is use the custom image search and upload specific cats and do um, and try and, uh, try and train the model with enough pictures uh, to recognize your cats. But like I said, the, the more specific you want that algorithm to be, the more you're going to lean towards uh, building out your own model with ML.net or TensorFlow or uh, one of the other products. Um, cognitive services is at its best when you can use their machine learning models out of the gate. So um, you, should, you should take a hard look at some of the other products before you try and use cognitive services to do something that's more uh, specific. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that piece of software, no. Um, so let me say something that's going to be fairly <laughs> uh, unresearched. But I mean, one of the nice things about Azure Cognitive Services, as opposed to some of the other open source projects, is this is hosted in the cloud. Right? I don't have to stand up my own server to host it. Uh, I don't have to maintain the model. Like That's kind of done for me. A lot of the other open source projects are just as powerful. They're just more labor intensive. Um, if you want to look at the specific one afterwards, I'd be happy to do that with you. Uh, I don't want to say anything else because, I, like I said, it's, it's, I don't want to say something wrong. Other questions? All right. If you want uh, this slide deck, it is available up on the VS Live webpage uh, for this session. 
the sample code is also there. If you want to see more of the stuff that I've written on cognitive services, it's available on my blog, which is humbletoolsmith.com. If you have questions for me, the easiest way to get a hold of me is on Twitter. I'm at Potter Eric. Uh, I would prefer to have something else with Potter in it, but you try and get anything online that has Potter in it. Um, apparently there's a book or something, I don't know. Anyway, uh, reach out to me. I would love to talk more about this. I'll be at the conference for the rest of the day. So uh, find me and uh, we can talk more or find me at lunch. I'd love to have a conversation with you about this. Uh, thank you. You've been a great audience and we'll see you around. <laughs>